Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with an Atari 800 XL board. So this belongs to William, 3DO kit, the, the nice chap that sent me the Atari Falcon actually. And I did offer, uh, you know, to look at anything he wanted to send me, so he's kindly, you know, sent me this. He sent me a load of other boards, I'll show you some of those within this video as well, but those are going to be other repairs and they're very cool, sent me some really cool stuff actually. Uh, especially the, the Atari stuff and there's like a little PC board, but anyway, we'll look at that later. Um, so yeah, Atari 800XL, let me show you what this is doing, uh, everything's connected up here, we've got uh, video, power from my 65XE here, switch it on. Now that's the first thing I saw, but if you switch it off and on, more often than not you either get a black screen or you get weird things like, I don't know, a white screen with some bands going up and down or a grey screen, it's really weird. My first thoughts actually look at this board is the MT RAM on it. It could be a RAM problem. Uh, we'll get the logic probe onto it I think first, but then I could perhaps scope a few things. Can you see that? We've got a grey background there. Then I could leave that for a second or two. Is that I'm doing anything? I don't think so. And if I feel around the chips, uh, nothing is getting hot really. The MMU gets warm after a minute, but just lukewarm. Everything else is pretty stone cold. Well, CPU's lukewarm as well I guess, and what I think is GTIA. But yeah, nothing. It's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like that's pixelized, isn't it? It's like a little grid with pixels there. And then that again. Strange how it varies so much. It might not be the RAM, it could be something else, like the MMU maybe. So, as I say, CPU, Sally, lukewarm here. Uh, that chip there, lukewarm, not as hot as Sally, actually. Other chips, cold really, I think this is pokey. That's the uh, PIA. And you can see I've written here, actually, Sally, GTA, Antic. Because the part numbers, I always find them really difficult uh, when you've not worked on the, you know, lots of these. Uh, to remember what the part numbers are, they've all got, you know, C0216 something, C0148891. It's really oh, difficult dealing with those blooming numbers. Uh, that's one thing I like about the Amiga boards when they start to write Paul or Gary, etc. It's really obvious what things actually are. Um, and of course, we can just wipe these marks off the silk screen later. Anyway, let's switch that off. The RAM, stone cold, but it's MT. You can just about see the MT uh, there. So, this RAM is renowned for failing. It fails a lot on all sorts of different uh, boards. Not just Atari's, but C64's and stuff as well. It's very common on the C64 to find that MT RAM has gone bad. Now in advance I got an Antic as a spare, I didn't realise it's an NTSC one. I think the Sally's are independent of region, you know. Uh, and the reason is you'll have a clock speed division difference, you know. The, the clock, main clock that feeds into one of these chips here is going to get divided down differently and then I think the chip that perhaps pairs with that, the GTAA, is going to have a difference there as well in order for the different resolution stuff. Um, because there are subtle differences there on resolution and obviously frequency is a key part of that. I've got a Sally as well, I've replaced the Sally, it makes no difference at all, it's exactly the same, so it's not Sally. We don't know about this, we don't know about that. I've removed the poking test without it because I think you should still get a blue screen with, without that and it may just freeze at the, uh, you know, the part where it uh, makes that clicking noise. So, could it be that? It could be the PIA, it could be a ROM, you know, one of these ROMs. It could be that, I think that's the MMU chip, isn't it? Um, I'm just thinking I might have the one I removed from my 65XE. Might be able to socket that up and use that to test that, actually, thinking about that. But I think the first thing we're going to do is just get the logic probe connected up here, have a look at the CPU, look at the clock, have a look at the RAM here, see if we've got any address and uh, data bus, you know, the uh, data pins on each of these, see if we've got activity. So then I thought I'd reseat these chips, so I just pulled this one out, and can you see here? We've got a pin folded down there. It's not broken off, it may break off yet. I need to try and get under it a little bit. Might need to use the knife here just to get under there, and try and just flip it back up, but it's probably going to break off that. You know, can you see that? Can you see how folded over that is? So reset is pin 40, switch it on. See that? Low then high. So we're getting the low pulse for the reset, and then coming out with the high. And then we've got Phi 2, uh, which is a phase shifted clock, you can see that's pulsing, uh, SO, whatever that is, that's low, and then another clock here, the main clock I think, pulsing. So we've got clocks as well. The read-write pin is 36, so 40, 
39, 38, 37, 36. Yeah, read writes pulsing, so it's doing something, it's not completely stalled. And then we've got halt, which is active low, that's pulsing. Uh, it's interesting actually, why would it be pulsing? That makes me think it's periodically uh, halting, but that could be as a consequence of one of these chips maybe halting that periodically or something like that in order to access RAM perhaps. Uh, and then we've got a mystery pin. Yeah, and we've got a not connected pin there, that's correct. I've looked on the board and the pin out shows that as a question mark. And then we've got data bus, so we've got healthy. Uh, that one's stuck. So D0 is pulsing. That's low, isn't it? D1. We got D2, D2, D. That's stuck. Pulsing, 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 pulsing. We want to address lines down here now. Hi, hi, hi. That's pulsing. That's pulsing, and that's the supply ground. So. We've got a couple of stuck bits, haven't we? That could be two bad RAM chips. Uh, let's just have a look at those again. So it's 33 to 26. Yeah, so we've got that one there, which is high. So D0 is high. Let's switch it off and on. Yeah, now it's not high, look. This is the thing. So you you need to you know power cycle with a problem like this to just to make sure it's not one specific bit that's sticking so that one isn't that's uh pulsing oh that ends up high that's interesting i think what's happening here we're getting some normal activity for a period of time and then something is going wrong Right, so I think I know what the fault is with this after two minutes of scoping it, actually. Let me just show you. I'm just going to scope the second pin along the top. I'll stick, stick a pin out so you can see which pin. Um, that's the CAS. Can you see? It's uh, flatlined. And it's, you know, there's noise there. And it's the same on every one of the DRAM chips. And I've done power cycles just to prove the point. And yeah, the CAS is flatlined. If I show you the RAS, let me just show you that. Hang on. That's RAS. Can you see that? Those little pulses. So the RAS is okay. You've got row address strobe, column address strobe. The column address strobe is flatlined. Now I traced on connectivity from that pin and I traced, I traced all around the 7 4 series and I found on this one here, top right, it's joined there. And if we look there, we'll see the same flat line. And you can see that there, still flatlined. Now the I'll show you the pin out to that chip in a minute. All the imports, I'll show you some of them here. It's high, 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 pulsing. Yeah, so they're all high apart from one that's pulsing, and they go through two and gates. The all of the um, highs there, and that's a high, that's a high. So all of the inputs are high apart from one that's pulsing. Yeah, now because they're going to um, an and, when the and condition is met, that pulse should pass through into the OR gate, and I believe that. I was thinking about this. I'm not sure actually now, because. There were two OR gates, I'll show you anyway, but nevertheless, there's nothing coming on the output. Now the thing I'm not clear about here, and it's and it's this pin here, pin 8, that's where the, uh, the CAS signal goes, yeah, so the output of this uh, OR gate here, I think it's an OR, yeah, those are ANDs. So yeah, it got high, high, high on the first AND gate there, so the conditions make you have a high coming out of there. Um, thinking about this, because it's an OR, it's just going to stay high, isn't it? Yeah, that could indicate it's uh, some one of the signals that comes in here is not there. Yeah, thinking about the logic there, I don't think that chip is the problem, but I do think the output is a problem. Something is not feeding one of the inputs in here correctly, I think. That could be the issue. So that it's not driving CAS as it should be doing. So it could be something else like the this MMU chip here, perhaps. And it is warm, that. Um, I'd be interested to see schematics. I think I would need to go away and look at some schematics now to see how the CAS is generated actually. We know it comes out of here, but what feeds this? I 
So I've spent quite a while messing with this. Let me just take the cartridge out. You can see I've got a diagnostics cartridge here. This is not as good as a SysCheck cart because it's literally just a ROM with some decoding. That is it. So if you've got a RAM fault, you're not going to be able to work that out with a cartridge like that. Now you can see I've got my new Rigol scope here. It's an old scope, but anyway, it's new to me. And I've been scoping various things around here. Initially, I thought there was something wrong with the CAS signal because I was looking at the CAS signal and it's pretty much flatlined most of the time. But that isn't actually the problem. It's a symptom rather than a, a cause, if you like. And this is the thing, you know, I've checked the clocks and stuff. I'm now looking for data bus activity. I was checking these RAMs here. Um, and then something uh, strange, well, I worked out something strange. Let me just show you. So I'll point you at the scope and I'll tell you exactly where I'm at probing here. I'm at probing pin two on each of these rams which is the data pin so if i switch it on and just watch can you see super low level here 240 millivolts and there's like a triangle edge to it now that could be because of scoping technique here got quite a long ground wire but nevertheless look flatlined switching it off and on it was normal for a second well so normal and then look it's dead low level and this is the thing and you get this on any of the ram chips so you know it's, it's random so that one's looking normal now but i've switched it off and on look Low level again. Low level. Flat lined almost. Uh, and I got to the next RAM chip, the th third one up now. But look, again, a little bit of movement there, hardly anything. Oh look, it jumped up to that level but not going down to the ground. So yeah, I mean that one's behaving differently to the other ones, isn't it? Sticking high a bit more than the others. But look, it's ground level there, not moving, not moving, not moving. You know, it starts to move at the beginning when you first power it on. So this is the next one up, next chip. Same thing, look, right down the bottom. Up to the top, down to the bottom. Switch it off and on, it's doing the next one. That looks normal for a second there, but it's... Well, it's kind of got a bias to it. And then look, small triangles again. And it's the same on all these. They all sort of behave the same sort of way, sporadically. You know, you get like that low voltage biased, right down at the bottom triangles again look <laughs> anyway long story short i thought well, let's put this in because this should disable basic i think i think that's how this works so if we put this in this is where things get interesting because despite all the testing i've been doing this i think is the biggest clue if i probe the data bus again bottom chip again pin two look at that we can see the low level stuff here mixed in with some high uh, level you know normal voltage well it's saying six volts there it's not six volts trust me uh, but nevertheless that's almost repeatable every single time you still see the small little triangle things going on down here as well so it looks a mess but the same thing up look on the next chip and the next chip and the next chip and the next chip and the next chip now this could be a consequence because it's running from car it's not doing something with RAM or I don't know that, that could be a cutover between ROM and RAM that's occurring there I mean I could do a pause on it kind of could do a capture let's just uh, probe that let's do run stop yeah so you can see square square triangle square that could be like a data bus access or something let's just uh, do that again so it's not like they're overlapping like they appear like they're overlapping but nevertheless there is a difference in uh, you know logic levels here this uh, perhaps is the problem I need to just have a quick check where the data lines go through. Do they go through ANSIC? I'm not sure actually. Or do they go straight to the CPU? It could be that all of the RAM is bad here. That might be the, the possibility. I don't think the RAM gets buffered. There are some uh, 158s for the address lines there. But we're looking at data bus here. Anyway, I just thought it was uh, interesting how that behaviour is different when it's got this cartridge in. So I think on the back of that, beyond going looking at the schematics now to see where the data bus goes, um, I think I may remove the ROM. It's, it's, it's warm, lukewarm. That's a bit cooler. That's lukewarm. Everything else here is cold. Uh, the Sally is about the same as the ROM there. So maybe we should just socket that up just to rule it out. Beyond that, I don't know, could we be looking at RAM fault? I don't think so, because it isn't just one bit. Those low level uh, triangle peaks there, if you like, that cannot be coming from the RAM, unless every single one of those RAM chips is bad. And I fail to believe that that's the issue. Now, it might not be the ROM, because you know what? Without an ANSIC, 
uh, obviously you don't get any data bus activity. I think it stops very early in its tracks, but it consistently gives a red screen now, rather than anything else random. And I can show you that here if I just switch it on. Look, red screen. It seems to be consistent as well. We've not got the random behaviour we're getting. That leads me to think it's perhaps something related to Antic. But again, it might not be. This could be a symptom rather than a cause. In other words, when you've not got an Antic there, it's failing very early on when that cart boots and giving a red screen. But if the Antic was there, it may get a little bit further and then crash out in the random ways that it is doing normally. See what I mean? So you can't always just take things like that, you know, on face value. But it's consistent. Yeah, if you have an antic uh, in there now, you'll get random different behaviour after this point. And that could indicate RAM, and it could be a case of this two faults. Right, I'm going to get the ROM off there anyway, because you know what, I've got a spare ROM. Um, it'd be nice to have that socket, I could smire the ROM as well, that's, uh, that's the thing. I've tested it with uh, another antic, but the only antic I've got is an NTSC one. So, um, would that cause the same thing? Well, what I mean is, so I've tried it with the US Antic, um, which it's not going to boot, it probably would give you a crash because of the timing difference, I assume. I'm assuming that Antic and T, uh, you know, GTAA have uh, you know, some clock division stuff going on that are specific to the regions. So if you mixed, as I've done here, it's not going to boot properly, but the behaviour there on the bus was the same. We saw the same thing with, you know, weird logic levels. So, I think that kind of rules out Antic. I don't think Antic is the issue. Right, let's do a bit of a uh, snappy off heat with this. I'm expecting this side to come off easier than the top side. What I should have done is flip the board around and works pushing the pins upwards as I heated. That's not even dissolved, is it? That lug dissolved a minute ago. What is going on there? I could have sworn that was free. It clearly isn't. I'm going to need to get the dissolved station onto that pin, I think. Yeah, that iron is not going to do it. So that side's lifted up a little bit there. I'm just trying to get under here. Can we get under there? Yeah, that side's coming up as well. So I think, I think that's off. Feels loose. It's just one of these things where you've got to, there you go, take your time and uh, very carefully get it off. There we go. So no pad or trace damage. Our ROM is off. I'm not even going to put a socket on there, I'm going to just go test it without that. I am assuming, and I could be wrong, I'm assuming, when you've got a test cartridge in there, that it probably disables that, perhaps. It might be a bit like the VIC-20 where it bootstraps from here and then detects whether there's a cart, but I don't know, we'll soon find out. Right, so without a ROM, we get a red screen all the time, which is exactly what we saw when we had no antic. So, you know what, I think it's a clue. I could be wrong, I could be totally wrong here, because it may be that when the ROM's there it gets further and then it fails further into the boot process, you know, either with GTAA or RAM or something. But anyway, let's get a socket on there now. I'm going with the turn pin because um, we might want to fit the old ROM back on. That's got to cut down short legs, hasn't it? So it's just going to make it a bit easier. I may need to just unblock the odd hole there. So hopefully the solder's going to flow okay on these uh, legs of this socket. It is uh, one that's just been sat on my component tray there for years. Just making sure it's flat. Nope, it's just the same. So, hmm, where does that leave us? The other thing I'm thinking is, the difference with this connected here, maybe it's some bulk to dress decoding. I think some of the chip selects come from this MMU here, certainly the CAS disabled does, because that was where, when I was looking at the CAS and noticed there was no CAS signal, I was like, hmm, is it this? Well, actually, that gets warm before anything else on the board, but just lukewarm, doesn't get red hot. Um, but nevertheless, you know, after, I don't know, several seconds of me on, it's lukewarm.
uh, it takes a good 30 seconds or so for the CPU to get up to temperature and the ROM. So we know it's definitely not the ROM, well assuming that ROM is good, I uh, have every reason to suspect that's good. Um, maybe I should just socket this up because you know what, again I've got one of these, I think the one on the 65XE is compatible as far as I understand, it's got the same number of pins and stuff so let's socket that up, we might even need to get a, a you know if this isn't compatible we might need to get a gal and program a gal up, I'm not sure yet so, so many hours later you can see I socketed up the RAM here, I am getting desperate uh, these are okay, I've logic probed these, these are okay 7474's all right the stuff around here, as far as I can tell, is okay. You've got you've got an and down here. That's all right. That's an inverter. Schmidt, not gay. Those are all right. The 138 looks all right. Uh, there's a, a combinational and or or something there. I think that seems all right, as far as I can tell. I've got a chip for that. I piggyback that. That seems all right. We've ruled out the MMU. The one thing I've just tried here is testing it without basic at all and then without pokey and actually these two things give consistent behavior when these are both in you just get random things black screen black screen gray screen blue screen red screen blocks all over the place scrolling patterns all sorts of weird stuff but i removed that and they got a permanent sort of red screen with a, a border you'll see and then i thought i'll take it a step further it's removed pokey and a similar sort of thing happens i think now it's consistently red let me just try that yeah so this perhaps is a big clue we get a red screen that way consistently every single time now if I fit pokey back in I'll show you hang on there's a chance that multiple chips are bad on here but anyway pokey's back in again this is consistent oh, hang on no it's not it's just red screen every time now that's weird so what can we replace that with I don't know, I could program for 27C256 maybe. I think there's too many pins actually. But the unused pins might be able to just hang it over the end. But yeah, it's red screen every single time now. Which is weird. It could still be something around here. Maybe the delay line. I'm not really, you know, the, the clock circuit around here. I can sort of follow some of it, but some of it is confusing me. So, I don't know, I'm out of ideas. Of course, what you would want to do with the board that's socketed like this is test these. Well, we've tested with an alternative antic based on the fact it's an NTSC one. You get the same behaviour though, so I think the antic's alright. I've got a Sally, we've tested Sally, that's alright. The only thing we can't rule out here is the GTAA. It could just be this. You know, I could have gone on this Crusader swapping all these things and doing all this stuff when all it needs is a new GTAA, but I can't find a PAL one at all. So, we've got no choice but to, you know, continue this way. Um, the worst case is it ends up fully functional with a new GTA 8 and the main chips are all shockers about aren't they? including the MMU and the RAM. So, a bit of a face palm moment here. Because obviously we've socketed up the RAM, we've socketed up the ROMs here. A mistake, that is not basic, that is the OS ROM. The larger one is the OS, yeah, that is basic. But in any case, the ROM's nothing to do with it. The MMU's nothing to do with it, the RAM's nothing to do with it. And I'm not sure whether I showed it, but one of the first things I did is I started checking the clock stuff out and stuff. Uh, and in particular CAS, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but one of the things I spotted early on was the CAS signal was missing. Now the CAS signal is derived from this delay line. The one thing I didn't do is actually probe or scope the delay line here. I was looking at the, I think there's like a combination land or there, I was looking at that and was like, well, the logic seems all right, seems like it's working, but there's no CAS signal pop, uh, you know, coming through. And then I skipped this chip and went right back to where some of the signals originate. Um, uh, you know, I tested everything around here really, the 7474, the and the inverter, uh, that combination of one, the 138, this 375 here, which ultimately feeds this. And I was like, well, I think everything's looking alright. And at that point, I became convinced probably what was happening is a data bus thing because you saw the difference in logic levels. We've got some, you know, four volt sort of logic levels, and then you get those little triangle peaks that look quite low down. Now, that could indicate another fault on this, but. That was what sidetracked me. That's what made me go off at a tangent, going, let's rule out the main ships here. You know, all the while I've been thinking maybe the GTA is the problem. Well, you, there could be more than one fault on this. It still may have two faults, but you know what? Coming back to this yesterday, it's blooming obvious the delay line is the problem here. So coming back to the delay line here, the pins on this side here, it's blooming obvious. If we look at the pin down here, you can see we've got a high 
there. Now this next one should should have a clock. We should have, uh, hang on, which one is that one there? That should be a phase adjustment of the original clock that comes in. And that's what each of the pins here, that one's pulsing, can you see that? So I've got a clock there on that pin, that's correct. Um, that's VCC I think. Yeah, but that one there is high and that one there is high. We've got two phases missing here. So what this does, you get a clock coming in and then each of the taps on this side here are phase adjustments. So for instance, you know, you've got high and it goes low like that. Well, it, it moves the clock, stretches it out, if you like, delays it a number of phases, yeah, you know, by a number of degrees. Um, and that's what each of these turns does, you know, one will be like 90 degrees, then 180 degrees, and it, it's a delay. That's all you're doing is you're delaying the, um, the clock. That, I think, is the problem. You can't get these anymore. You can't even get them second hand. What you can do is get a replacement one, and that's what I've ordered. I ordered one from Poland. Now, I don't know how reliable it's going to be because there's different ways of replicating the functionality of a delay line. You may think, well, just use some 74 series and you know, run it through a number of gates on the 74 series, and you get some propagation there. And if you time it right, it, you know, you calculate your, your delays accurately there, you can get uh, you know, a relatively accurate representation, you know, replacement rather. Um, but from what I understand, temperature and uh, you know temperature can affect things like that as well. So uh, I think you've got to use some res resistors and caps and things as well. Um, and obviously the ICUs is obviously you know a key part of how accurate and dependable something like that would be. So anyway, we'll see what happens with the the device that comes. The way it's sat now on the screen, let me show you. So all the while I've been talking, that's that seems to be what it looks like most of the time now, actually. Oh look, black screen again. So yeah, most of the time black screen, but occasionally you do get these random blocks and things. And obviously that's with the, the test cart in there. I'll remove the test cart. It doesn't seem to vary very much. Sometimes you'll get a grey screen, sometimes a red screen, sometimes blocks and things. So the irony is, I was looking at the CAS signal very early on. It was the first thing I noticed that the CAS signal was missing on the RAM. And if I just spent just another 10 seconds and checked that, I'd be like, oh, that's the issue spotted that really quick and would have avoided sockets and these things but you know what this gives me an opportunity to test all my ram i've not had a you know a, a situation where i could test all my 4164 or 4264 ram and similarly i can test my os rom there i can test the mmu from the 65 xc on here because in theory it should work should be the same we've got its original one on there for the moment and then of course i've got a replacement sally and i've got an ntsc antic so i can test those things now these things are sockets as well these were already socketed but that is a key component in you know creating the correct CAS signal there, based on RAS coming in and uh, you know a few other signals. So yeah, without that, you're not going to have a CAS signal, or you're going to have an inaccurate CAS signal. And when you're either missing the CAS signal, or the CAS signal is inaccurate in its timing, you know the start and end of the you know trailing lead and edges are not correct in respect to the RAS. That means you've got no RAM. You just tell, it doesn't matter what RAM you put in here, it's always, you know, the system will behave as if there's no RAM, yeah? And you're just going to get random things, you know, it's not going to read and write correctly into that RAM. Which means your stack is knackered, which means, you know, diagnostic stuff like this just isn't going to run. As soon as you really comes to need the stack, it's going to fall over. Um, so, yeah, that, that I think is the problem, and it is a bit of egg on my face. So whilst I'm waiting for that replacement delay line, I'm going to dissolve that now, switch it off, disconnect it all, get it over to the mat, we'll stick a socket on there, I think. Um, I'm probably going to go with turn pin for that. The thing I'm curious about, and I might even try and get into this at some point, we'll wait until we've replaced it first so we know it's definitely the issue, but you know what, the fact we see high and high on a couple of the phases here, you know, the outputs, that I don't think is normal. That shouldn't. That's not right. It should be like the pin that's up here. One of them is pulsing, so it's like not all of it's failed. It's it's just two of the taps here. Um, but what I'm thinking is, I might be able to crack the top off this. It's like plastic, isn't it? And we might be able to see inside it. I don't know. Maybe there's something we can see in there. But again, if it's just some silicon or something in there, we're not going to be able to do anything with it. I'm just curious as whether there's any windings or I don't know anything like that in there. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Not all the pins are fitted on this chip. It's got gaps in between, which makes it easier. Mm -hmm. 
So I smoothed the end of that down, that's going to be uh, okay. And I've just unblocked the additional holes here because what I really should do is cut the unused pins off here, but I'd rather just, you know, solder them all there. So I'll just clean off where I've just soldered those uh, pins that were blocked, you know, pads that were blocked rather. And then we can get that into position. There we go, perfect. But yeah, so it's absolutely the delay line. If I probe these pins here, I'll show you on the scope. Right, so I'm doing that first one nearest the bottom right there. It's high, look, it's just high. And the next one, it's just high. That's right, this is about three weeks later. It's took forever for this little chip to come from Poland. Uh, well, you can blame the uh, pandemic as the cause there. The first observation here, can you see this? Look at the pins there. The alignment is crazy. What's actually happened here? Someone's, uh, well, I'm not really sure what's happened actually. I think that the pitch is 2.54 here. And I think the pitch on here is not 2.54. I can't really explain it any other way. Either that or the pin headers that have been used. Well, I don't know. They seem soldered on there correctly. So I can't quite make sense of that actually. That is a little bit strange. Uh, so I've been inspecting magnification, pin 1 is the top left corner there. So you can see there's a little, um, I think that's a delay line, it might not be. Uh, let me just have a look at it. It looks like it says SM15609. So, I don't know, is that a delay line? Or is that some of the logic? I've got no idea. Because there's, there's some resistors here as well, which make me think those are used as part of the, the delay there. It's strange that the pins on that side are almost straight. Those are more crooked than the others, so I don't know, it's bizarre. Anyway, let's just try and get this in here. Uh, now, turn pin. It's always better to have turn pin for something like this, you know what? It's going to be really tight fitting this in here. Yeah, there we go, that's in. Do you think this is going to fix it? I do, actually, and it's really annoying. It's like, say, egg on my face because we removed the MMU, the ROMs, and the RAM before I came back to something that I picked up very early on, which was missing cast signal. So let's switch it on and see what happens. Ah, there we go. There we go. It was that straight. What? What is? Oh, that is so, just so annoying though. Because I did spot that. I spot. It was one of the first things I noticed that there was, the cast signal was missing. So yeah, kicking myself. Really kicking myself on this one. But you know what? It was a good idea to remove this RAM at the very least. Um, and you could argue, you know, I'm now able to test my MMU in here as well. It's the one from the 65XE. It's got a different part number, but I will bet that works. And I know that because uh, I've read some information on those. And apparently there's three or four different part numbers and they're all the same chip. Um, I can also test my ROMs as well, but uh, yeah, the, the reason why this is beneficial, the MT RAM is unreliable, we've removed the MT RAM, I've got some KSC on there I think at the moment, but I've got some other ones as well I can test, so I can test all my different RAM, including the original MT RAM, I won't send it back to William with the MT RAM, he can have either the KSC or I've got some, uh, or I've got uh, this uh, set of eight chips here that I was testing previously, I think these are all good, They're, these are all brand new, uh, and those are, is that Hyundai? It's a tar actually I think. I think these ones are Itachi but those are a good substitute as well. So yeah it's going to be better without the MT chips. And now that most of the chips on this board are socketed, you know the Pokey socket here, both ROMs are socketed, the only one that isn't is the uh, PIA, is it PIA? Makes this board a bit easier to work on moving forward. William could easily swap some of these chips if he ever had an issue again. And the other thing I would point out is some of the mods you can do to the Atari, uh, you know, if you look back at my 65XE video, we had to socket this for one of the mods, I think, and we had to socket one of the ROMs here. So I think William is intending on upgrading this, and that's going to aid with any kind of upgrades, you know, the fact that you can just literally unplug the ROM and plug something in there, um, and the same with the MMU, if you know, upgrades the RAM or something on this then uh, yeah, that's going to support the, the process. Anyway, I am very pleased. Let me just power that off. I'm going to try it with that Super Salt cartridge. I'll show you in a minute uh, how that's wired up, how it's connected, because it, you've got to face it the right way around. Um, yeah, so that looks all right. The thing I'm not sure about here is the colours. Um, the colour, you know, you can adjust it with a little uh, variable... Uh, I'm not sure if it's a variable cap or a variable resistor. Um, I can show you that in a minute, but anyway, yeah, the colour, I am not sure those colours correct. I mean, the blue looks correct when you test it without the cartridge. Let me just uh, do that again. 
what I need to do now though is simulate some key presses. I don't have a keyboard membrane for this. So I'm going to have to short some connections on the keyboard strip together to simulate holding down option to get into test mode I think. And you can see I've got the clips ready for this here actually. If we just uh, clip that onto uh, ground here. Let's do that one because it sticks out quite a long way actually. There we go. So we've got a ground. And uh, looking at the pin out for this, the first of the but select buttons, you know, like I think it's reset, is that bottom one there. Yeah, that's reset the system. So if I switch it off, the next one up, the third one from the bottom, is option. So if I just hold that on there, we are holding option to ground. And you can see that there. Now, again, are those colours correct? I don't know. I don't remember it looking this colour. Let me just try adjusting the, the, that variable uh, component. I'll show you where it is in a minute. So we'll lose colour there. I don't know. There seems to be a sweet spot for that. If it's in the wrong spot you get no colour. It seems like that is crystal clear and those are the colours. I just don't remember it looking that way. Uh, anyway, so doing the same thing on the keyboard strip there. So that third one down was the um, option. So let's press the next one up. I think that's the select button, is it? Yeah, look, it's gone to audio visual. Let's do audio visual. And then I'll hit the one above it, which is that. So let's test in pokey. I'm not sure about those colours, you know, they look a bit strange. What I really need to do with this now is test it with a game, really, to see if the colours look alright. It could be a consequence of this ROM. I'm wondering if this particular revision of the ROM, I think it's Rev B. Maybe it uses a different palette there, I don't know. Why is the screen green now? Yeah, you see, so that's me adjusting that pot. So we didn't have the right colours there. That looks right. Let's just cycle the power again. Yeah, so I'll hold down option again. Yeah, okay, so those are the colours. Is that right? Is that wrong? No idea. Let's just do a uh, memory test. You see, look at that. Red? I don't remember seeing a red screen for the memory test. So it didn't take me very long to come to a conclusion actually regards the uh, colour problem there. So you can see, you know, this is incorrect here. This should be like more of a brown rather than an orange. The C obviously shouldn't be green. It should have light blue up here, that's not too far off. And the sun should be yellow, not sort of pink. So yeah, there is a problem. And in terms of diagnosis, yeah, GTIA. <coughs> it's a faulty GTIA. Yeah, I can show you, yeah, I think you've got composite on the end pin here, and I'll show you on the scope in a second. And then you've got three colour bits that follow that. Not really colour bits, three luminance bits. Uh, I think it goes like three, two, one, and then and the other lumens bit is there, and that's the bit I am scoping there, L zero. If I show you the other bits again, so you've got colour on the end here. Did I say composite before? I meant colour, and then you've got luminance uh, three, I think, or I'm not, sure. yeah, and that's luminance three, I think, and then we've got luminance two, luminance one. So you can see those three bits are, you know, showing activity, which is what you'd expect. Uh, and if I go to the the one that's not doing anything. See, it's just flatlined. It's just ground. So if I take it off, touch it again, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Totally flatlined. So, yeah, you'd expect activity on all four of those luminance bits, I think. I think that's fair to say. So, really annoying. It needs a new GTIA. <coughs> Now these GTIAs are like fairy dust, they are impossible to find. Um, now one thought I did have is to swap this out with a Sophia. Now if you're not aware, the Sophia is a, an FPGA based, it might be CPLD, but anyway it's a modern replacement for the GTIA and you get RGB output. I think actually uh, there's a version 2 of the Sophia that has like a, a DVI connector so you can connect a monitor directly to it but in any case that's not even an option at the moment anyway because the FPGAs or CPLDs that are on those they're unavailable because of the pandemic so oh, it's an absolute nightmare this it's like one step forward one step back so we've got this up and running but obviously the graphics are messed up the other thought I did have is I could take the GTA off my 65XC fit that on here that would work um, 
And I'm sure that's the issue, by the way, that pin there, you know, it's, it's low. You may think, oh, maybe something's influencing that. Well, the signal's come through, through out, uh, to here. I think they've got some pull-ups on these resistors, and they come to this uh, 4050, which is uh, an inverter, some CMOS inverter. Um, everything around there looks normal. You can actually see, you know, the, the, all the gates work okay for the, the other luminance signals where we have got output, but we've just got a low and a low. Now, if you lift the pin out of here, so it's floating outside the socket, it's still just the same, it's low, so it's not been influenced by something here pulling it to, to ground, it's, it's just not outputting at all. Uh, now the other interesting thing with that, let me show you if I switch this off, I think that's what's probably killed it. If I remove the uh, GTIA chip here, you can see the socket has suffered some damage, can you see that pin there? I noticed it very early on, but I measured connectivity and the connectivity was there so it seems like something's happened to that pin in the past and if you look at the pin here can you see it looks a funny color it's like shiny on top so something has happened to this at that point uh, in the past i'm not sure what it's bizarre now i'm not sure i've got i've not sure i mentioned it yet but when i removed the ram here one of the pins was completely folded over and soldered onto the board <laughs> it's amazing it worked uh, i can perhaps show you that i forget where the chips are they're up here hang on can you see that pin? That's how it was soldered on the board, with its pin completely flattened. So, of course, you know, on the top side, there was just enough solder, just barely connecting it. But it was folded on the underside, you know, on the top side of the board here. When I And, and the reason I know that is because when I came to the solder, I was like, you know, to solder all these pins, hang on a minute, there's no pin there. Why is there no pin? So I just continued desoldering all the way around. And then when I lifted it off, it was like that. So I was like, ah, oh, there we go. So, I mean, that was a problem waiting to happen from factory. So I straightened up that pin and I fitted the MT run there just to test it. And with a wire, I forced it into test mode there and uh, just going through the run test. Obviously, we've got another run test on the Super Salt cart, but that's a bit harder because you've got to type R and then press return, I think. In fact, I think you need to press R twice and then press return. No, you know what? I'm still thinking it's the GTAA, but it's not the Luma signal because I've just removed that again. And all that is affecting is, as you would imagine, the brightness. So, the, well, the colour signal comes out of here, doesn't it, the chroma? So, maybe it still is this. But, there's a chance that a clock this gets has an issue, perhaps. I think I need to look at the GTAA and see where it gets fed from regards to clocks. Because a delay there, maybe a phase difference, maybe this is still the issue. Or something that this connects to. Mind you, this seems to be just for the DRAM, actually. So, um, I am not sure what is going on here. This certainly is not an open and shut case on the GTAA. So, I checked these transistors here. But then I've just gone back over here. Now, I removed this port, cleaned this port, measured it off the board, 500k. You know, and it does adjust each way. And then I measured pin 17 on here, which is like 4... From the end, I think 29, 18, 17, yeah. And I could see the line go up and down via adjustment there, but it's just a flat line, there's no shape to it. Now, the interesting thing is this circuit here it gets fed in a uh, clock of some sort, I'm not sure what. And you can see it goes in here, let me show you the scope. So, this goes into the base of the transistor, it's coupled by a capacitor. So, you can see those little peaks there. Now the interesting thing is, if I look at the, uh, I think this is the emitter, it's flat, and that's the collector. So I've got a voltage on the collector there, but nothing on the emitter. It's just flatlined, you know, if you look at its base, look. Emitter, nothing. So I think the transistor might be the issue. But you know what, I'm just going to get this over to the mat again, take that transistor off and just test it. Who I think I found fault, it's not the GTIA. So you can see I've got this connected up to the component tester here. All the legs are isolated. Unknown faulty component. <laughs> there we go. That's what it is. It's just a 3N2904, I think, or something like that. Let's just test the replacement here. I think it goes collector base emitter, I'm not sure. Yeah, that one's alright, NPN silicon. So let's get that on there. Well, you know what, I think that's fixed it. I just switched it on and the blue looked more normal. So, let's see what happens here now. Yeah, the colours look different there now. This was flashing crazily before. Now it's kind of like toggling between just three or two or three or four colours there. 
it looks different and the whites look white. So yeah, I think that's I think that's fixed it. It doesn't need a GTIA, which is fantastic. Of course the proof is in the pudding. Is it gonna look right here? Are we gonna have a blue sky and blue sea? Oh yes, fantastic! Hard to believe, really hard to believe. And look, everything's changed. The colours, you know, we've got red here, we didn't have that before. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> wow, that's hard to believe. So, just adjusting that part, you can see now, yeah, we've got a level of control there, but we've got normal colours. That's kind of like normal, I think, there. So, I'll leave it set like that. I'll let William know, uh, just do the final test on this now, but that was the final piece of the puzzle. Fantastic. So I'm using the solder socket here just to desolder the, the last remaining pins on the socket. Uh, I thought it was a good idea to swap this socket out. It's a single white one. The other few sockets on there are okay. This one has got that dodgy pin though, hasn't it, where the L0 uh, is, you know, the luminance zero. Um, you know, so at some point in the past, something has occurred there. That wasn't me. It was like that when I received it. So, it's just a little bit of solder there, actually. Yeah, so it's a good idea to swap it. Uh, but also, William may fit a Sophia onto this himself once those, uh, you know, become available. Um, and if we swap this out, that's going to make that easier. If I can, I'll fit a turn pin socket. Yeah, so I found a turn pin socket here, just inspecting it, looks okay. Uh, let's just try and uh, get that on there. And I got the wrist strap on again. I had the wrist strap on when I removed this IC. I don't want to take any chances, you know what, because it's like right now, see this jumper? It's uh, generating a huge amount of static electricity. I've uh, said in previous videos, I cannot generate static, and that's true. Compared to when I was younger, something about your resistance to your skin. As my skin's got old and wrinkly here, it's uh, uh, hard for me to get static electricity from anything I wear generally. But you know what? This jumper is an exception. Um, so let's just try and get that in. There we go. Push it in. Just make sure the pins are all in there correct. So the final thing will be just to clean the underside of the board here. And obviously you can see I've got the MT ram back in here at the moment, just testing. But we'll swap that for something else. I won't send that back to William with the crappy MT ram. He can have uh, the Oki or, uh, I don't know, Hyundai or whatever I've got, Hitachi perhaps. So just consider this a bonus. If you've never seen inside one of these, um, the battery has uh, failed on this. So this belonged to the late Alison Chalice. Um, you can see here, it's one of those... Uh, batteries you're getting cameras which needs replacing. So I've took the old one out, oh god I've just pulled the whole thing out, let's just try and put it back in position. Yeah there we go. Uh, got a new battery here I think. Have I just mixed these up? Let's just, let's just test this, just put the battery in. Let's just uh, try and power it on. Yeah there we go that's working. So yeah they're very nice these, I'm getting bits of solder here that I don't want to, to get in the way look. They're very nice bits of equipment these, these peak meters. I wish I could afford some more of these. I've got um, the Capastans one, and I've got this one, and I've got like an LCR tester, I think. Um, two of them belong to Alice and Chalice, but then I got the Capastans meter uh, last Christmas, or was it Christmas before, I think, actually, with the, some vouchers. Um, they're very good, though. These peak Atlas meters are fantastic. So let's retest that transistor. It's curious, isn't it, how that transistor failed on the video side there. And uh, the delay line was the problem with the, the RAM, you know, the clocks, the, the cans not getting to the uh, RAM. Weird how two different faults like that could develop in one system. Test this battery, actually. I'm curious to see how low it's uh, gone. I think they're 12 volt, these, aren't they? And as I say, you used to use these in cameras, you know, the old... Uh, cameras, <laughs> you know when we had a film, do you remember that film? Yeah, 1.4 volts, I'm sure those are supposed to be 12 volts. Yes, I'm not sure whether you can see there, it is 12 volts, alkaline battery, 12 volts, so yeah, that's gone down to 1 volt, it's incredible. Just testing that MT RAM one final time before I swap the RAM over and then I'll clean the board up. But as you can see, the colours, that's, that's what I would expect actually. It's like a dark green, isn't it, and these blocks here are green and yeah, that's all looking normal now. 
it is obviously really useful to have a little wire like that and uh, you know short between ground and the uh, function key uh, connections there so I could be wrong I think that bottom one's ground but I stay away from that I use the ground from one of these here yeah and then the next one up is reset then you've got the option so if you hold ground to the option while you power it on and then eventually it should come into self-test here and then the next one up is select and the next one up is start so if you just want to do a memory test you just hold the ground wire onto the third pin power it on you do need to make sure you've got a proper reset. One of the things I noticed with this board that's doing the same thing as that 65XE, if you switch it off and then on really quick, it doesn't do the sort of clicking noise at the start, it just comes straight up with ready, instantly. You've got to switch this off for 20 or 30 seconds and then switch it on, and then you can hear that clicking noise, but you've got to have the ground on there, on that third pin down, you know, third pin from the bottom. And then it'll go into self-test, and then don't do select, otherwise you'll, you'll select the next test down. To do a memory, just go to the fifth one up there, and that's the start. And it should go straight into the ROM slash RAM test. So I've got the wrist strap on here. This is the RAM that I'm going to fit. It's it's Archie, and you can see there. I think yeah, W Germany on the top, West Germany. So this was manufactured before the Berlin Wall came down. I think. I'm not sure there's a date code on there. Is there a date code? Yeah, there is actually. I think 29th week of 84. Would that fit? With the Berlin Wall? Yeah, I think it would. I think it was after that that the wall came down. So, yeah, a piece of history. <laughs> these, I remember distinctly ordering these, actually. The brand, they were brand new. You know, you can see the legs are unused on them. I think I ordered, like, 64 of these back in the day. But they never got used, you know, the business was wrapped up and stuff, and I bought some of the old stock when I left. So, yes, these chips are good. Um, I'm using the dip extractor here. It's, uh, yeah, it's not a very good dip extractor, but nevertheless, you can just get under the edges like that. Hang on. And as you can see, I repaired the old single wipe socket there. Yeah, I will repair and save anything. So yeah, just pull the pin out, they pull out from this end. And then just, uh, you know, it, it, I'll show you, it was like, it was like that, instead of being like that. That's all that happened, it got squashed right down. So the blade that makes a connection with the pin here, you know, the pin comes in next to this. It was sat like that in the socket, so, you know, bending it right out like that, and then sliding it back in, the pin will now, you know, snugly make a connection down by the plastic edge there so yeah that's good enough to reuse you wouldn't want to reuse a single wipe socket generally but you know what i always keep just one or two things like this just in case i run out of sockets i'm working on the board and i know the socket is super bad on the board i'm working on i could fit this in there and it would be reliable enough So the next thing I'll do here is just clean up the top of the board. I'm just going to wipe these off and I'm going to stick a label on there actually. It's just going to make it easier for anybody maintaining this uh, moving forward. I mean obviously if you're experienced in a board like this, you know exactly which chips are which. I'll leave that bit of tape on there. It might have been something they all had, I don't know. It almost looks like someone's drawn a smiley face there. Can you see we've got a dot, dot, <laughs> a little thing I'm tempted to draw over that, but you know what, it's not my board, so uh, yeah, anyway. The other thing we need to do here is straighten up this port because it's kind of like floating off the board. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is just to solder these points here and uh, straighten it and then re-solder them because they're so bent. Yeah, that's looking really straight now. Band is to the edge of the board here. Yeah, there we go. Just leaving it to travel through because that rail is absorbing tons of heat. There we go, that's one side done. Positive side. Same thing, just push it flat, hold it for a second or two. There we go, all done. And if you're curious, uh, and I always am, 
yeah that was a good idea to swap that out it's supposed to be 470 that's nearly 600 now the tolerance on these were way out in the day you know so it could have been 20 percent tolerance but the fact that's nearly 600 microfarad and the SR was really low there look at that 0 0.1 that is also uh, what I was talking about, I think I may have mentioned in this video, where you've got to know how to use these meters, because sometimes it can give you something like that where you go, oh, it's, it's not only is it really good ESR, it's extra capacitance, it's great. Um, I think Exos covered this recently on his uh, forum or his blog, actually, the very, that this exact point that sometimes, certainly on these Ataris, you can think the cap's good when really it, it does need swapping out, so I, I think that needs swapping out, actually, because that is suspiciously low for the additional high capacitance. So final test here with Yump. everything is working. I'm just testing the joystick port after adjusting it. And as you can see, that is working fine. Let's turn up a bit. Great music on this. There's a C64 version of this now as well. It's not quite as good on the C64 just because of the music. It sounds great on the pokey here. And they changed the tune, I think, that's the issue. You only use left and right on this, but I've used up and down on the uh, SD thing. I forget what it's called. I'll stick it up top left um, on the menu there, so I know all the directions are working and the fire button works. You can test the fire button here. Yeah, that works. Oh, there's holes there, look. So I want to show you what that delay line is doing actually. I've got the trigger on channel one. Now channel one, I've got that on the clock input, I think I have there. And if we have a look at one of the uh, outputs on that delay line, can you see? So uh, the fact it's triggering on channel one, you can see that channel two, the blue line, its positive peak goes up and extends a little bit, just a little bit there. Um, but there's a delay, you know, it's phase adjusted. Look at that one, that sort of looks the other side, doesn't it? Because it's, it's probably delayed so much that uh, it looks like it's coming back on itself. Yeah, there might be another one on the other side, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think there's one there as well, look. Yeah, there's one there. So, yeah, that's what it does. It's, uh, you know, delaying the... Uh, it's delaying the clock by a certain number of nanoseconds. Anyway, we are now all done. The board is cleaned up. We got rid of the MT RAM. Yeah, all right. <laughs> that was a mistake, but uh, it was a good idea. So he's got some better RAM here, socketed up. Um, we replaced the socket on the GTIA. The first problem we had was the delay line. That was a bit of a surprise, really, but not so much. When I remembered back that the, one of the first things I noticed was the CAS signal was missing. So, yeah, if you check the CAS signals on the, here on the RAM and you see no activity, you want to go backwards and start looking, you know, some logic that this feeds into one of the, it's like a combination land or or something up here, and then trace back through here to make sure the clocks are coming out on the, mostly on the right hand side pins here actually, but I think there's one on the other side as an output. And obviously I socketed up the ROMs when it didn't really need to be done, but you know what? Thinking about this, William wants to do upgrade this. Well, if you want to stick a one meg RAM board, you need the MMU socketed because the little thing goes in there. You need, I think, the OS ROM socketed and your CPU. Well, the CPU socket was already socketed on here. The socket's there, they're single white, but they're all right. There's nothing wrong with them, they're really tight, clean uh, sockets. So there's no reason to want to swap those. But anyway, the bottom line is because I socketed these things up, it makes it easy to upgrade the RAM to one meg. That's a possibility. Um, but we did need to swap that socket because that, you know, there was one pin in the socket there that was absolutely awful. Um, and as I say, William's going to put a Sophia in this, I think, at some point. It, it, the best thing to do with that actually is to remove the modular back here because you can then fit the video connector where the uh, modular output normally goes. And I know we covered this on other systems as well, but you know, using uh, a wire here to simulate key presses, I guess that's useful information. So this will be winging its way back to William. If you're not aware, William is the chap that kindly donated the Atari Falcon to the channel. So yeah, I've covered all the cost here, including the shipping. I'm very happy to do that. And actually this came with a load more boards. I'm not sure whether I showed them in this video, but yeah, he sent me about five or six of the boards and a couple of really rare Atari upgrades, but we'll look at those in another video. 
So I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, keep the channel going, please see the Patreon and Coffee it links down below. But thanks to everyone that supports the channel via Patreon and Coffee. It uh, has meant that the channel's kept going for the last two years, so I'm very, very grateful. Catch you in the next video.